first transmitted in 1928. One of the few amateurs who needs an introduction. He worked for Marconi for 30 years, then as a consultant for another 17 years. He has visited, not worked, 75 countries, and he has held 55 call signs during that time. But Louis Varney is most famous, of course, for his antenna, the G5RV. His talk will be largely about antennas and matching. It will be in two parts. May I say without any further ado, a very, very warm welcome to you, Louis Varney, G5RV from the Norfolk Amateur Radio. Uh, multiple uh, 
number of half waves, either in or out of phase, uh, I decided that three half waves out of phase on 14 megs, which as I just said, my favorite band, would be the thing. And having decided that, I then did two things. I worked out what the, um, what the standing waves on the antenna would look like for various bands. In this case, I've included 3.5 and a 7 and a 14. But in a moment, I'll show you what happened on the other band. Having done that, I decided that it would, it would be essential that the whole system should be uh, brought to resonance. Now, the way to do that, of course, as you all know, is to make the antenna of the correct length for a particular band so that it is a half wave or a full wave or whatever. But, again, you can't do that unless you have the facility of bringing the whole system into resonance at the frequency of the sun from the station end. Now this means to say that you must also be able to either have different lengths of feeder according to the band you want to work on, which is impractical, or you must tune the feeder system and the antenna together to make the whole thing resonant on the band that you are going to use. And later on we'll have a look at one or two typical um, antenna system tuning units. And I would ask you not to think that I'm being pedantic when I talk about ASTUs and not ATUs, or as our American friends call them, transmatches. I deliberately use ASTU because what I'm talking about has the job of tuning the feeder and the antenna to resonance at any frequency you choose to use it and for which it's suitable. And this is extremely important. Uh, I'd like you to bear that in mind because it, uh, it, it's rather more important than many people uh, think and that the antenna doesn't really very much like an unbalanced feeder being connected to its center. It, you, it won't uh, collapse or do anything disastrous, but it won't give you the polar diagram that you think it should give. So, you better not get too deeply involved in that, but simply to say uh, that be careful where you use balance. I will talk a little bit more about that at this time in the second half of the talk, because there are some other interesting points about balance which are not widely appreciated. So, this in, in fact was the staff, you see, and uh, it worked very well. So I then decided that I would investigate how it worked on uh, various bands and uh, I don't well, I don't think I'll show you that take up time. Let's have a look now at what the standing wave on the top and on the so-called matching section, which is much more correctly known as a makeup section, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. But there we are, and that is the, uh, the current distribution on the makeup section, which used to be incorrectly called uh, the matching section, and half of the top, flat top as the Americans actually call it, of the antenna. I haven't shown the other half because of course it's a mirror image and it can take up space. But now you see, I think you'll begin to see what I mean by the fact that this um, makeup section uh, doesn't really do any pins matching what it does do, if we can jump for a moment to 14 megs, there is half of the antenna, you see, or the, the current, this is, or the current standing wave, and this is what happens on the makeup section. Now, that is very useful indeed, because what it does is to uh, move 
the center of the antenna, if you like, electrically, down to the base of that stub, where, if you wish, you can attach a coax feeder or a 75 ohm twin lead or um, 300 ohm ribbon with windows, the modern type, which is uh, virtually low loss, or best of all, of course, about a 450 ohm um, open wire line, which I strongly advocate. This is the successor if you like, of the old 600 ohm open wire line I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is, of course, by far the most efficient feeder that you can use. It's much more efficient than coax for a given length at a given frequency, and of course it's more efficient than these quite useful modern uh, feeders, manufactured feeders, that we can buy now, uh, especially the 350 ohm, or I think it's sometimes loosely called 300 ohm ribbon feeder with windows, which is very good indeed also. Coming back to the original, one of my original points, of course, we cannot, as amateurs, with limited garden space in most cases, we cannot hope to have separate dipoles for all the various bands, however ideal that may sound. And those of us that can uh, have multi-element beam antennas, rotary beams, Yagis, for example, uh, who are very fortunate, because they are a very useful tool, of course, but the idea of an, a Yagi for 40 meters, or even 80 meters, uh, which, although our American friends, bless them, are able to use them in large quantities, apparently, that is out of the question here, unless you happen to be a farmer or a member of what I think used to be called the landed gentry. But uh, certainly for most of us, uh, this is out of the question. So, we have to make the best use of the space we have. Now, uh, coming to that also, there is an interesting uh, sideline for that, and it is this, that many amateurs I talk to say, well, my main interest is um, working pals in Australia, uh, my garden runs the wrong direction, you know, and even if I put up a dipole dedicated to my schedule old um, VK2 CXW or whatever it is, um, you know, I can't do it because it, it doesn't run right. Well, my advice is don't lose any sleep over that for the reason that, first of all, as I showed you at the beginning, a dipole uh, does have effective radiation off, radiation off its ends, and if it ends have to point you to Melbourne, uh, don't give up because, in fact, the lower zenithal angle of radiation which takes place from the end of dipoles, although the power is considerably less than the maximum power generated at right angle, not generated, uh, transmitted at right angles to the wire, nevertheless, uh, a few watts even at five degrees above the horizon on conditions which are good for VK is super. What you're looking for is low angle radiation and that gives you, the, you can, I'm sure, will appreciate the fewest hops between your station, the heaviside layer, the earth or the sea, and up again the heaviside layer, which it has to do to get to Australia. Uh, so that, in fact, if your garden has to be orientated the wrong way, my advice is don't worry. What you should do is to put all your efforts into making your antenna, whatever you're going to use, and its feeder system as efficient as possible. And although there isn't time to go into it in a talk like this, um, you must do a little bit of maintenance on your antennas. I'm sure most of you do, but uh, quite a lot of people don't. And uh, it is very important indeed. However, that's uh, really out of the uh, scope.